your word, that the word of God would fall on good ground, bringing forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you will turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John, the Gospel of John. And we're going to go to chapter 13. The Gospel of John, chapter 13. We have been teaching most recently on the subject of love, God's love. And uh, we have studied in our time of uh, study, we've studied first of all uh, about God's love for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have what? Everlasting life. God proved his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the proof of God's love is that not only did he say it, he acted on it, he did it. He proved his love by sending his son, giving his son, Jesus, to die on our behalf. So God loved us. Understanding that God loved us, we receive by faith Jesus as the Lord of our life. And Jesus, talking about the new birth in John chapter 3, he said, you must be born again. And he's talking about in that uh, passage, your spirit, your inner man being born again and receiving eternal life. And then, of course, we looked at Peter how that you're born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So God's word, when you heard the good news of Jesus and heard the gospel, you believed it, you received it, and you were born again. Spiritually, you received a new life from God. And when you receive that life on the inside, it's called eternal life. So you receive the eternal life of God in your spirit. We saw as well that in Peter that you were a partaker by this new birth of God's divine nature. And the reason is that God is love. And when you are born of God, then you are born of love and you have God's love dwelling on the inside of you. God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God dwells in him. So God has come to live and dwell on the inside of you by faith in Jesus Christ. And so therefore, you have God's love residing in your heart or abiding in your heart. In our study last week in John 17, we saw that God has loved us just like he loved Jesus. And again, he proved his love for us by giving Jesus for us. And Jesus in his prayer to the Father said, and you have loved them as you have loved me. In verse 26 of John 17, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. So God loved us. He had love for us. He proved that love to us in sending his son Jesus to die in our place for us. But then that same love that God had for Jesus, Jesus said that that love may be in them. So when we were born again or born of God, then that love of God came and and came to reside or live and abide in our hearts. So God's love is in you. Well, then that brings us, of course, to John chapter 15. In John chapter 15 and verse 12, he said, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So how could God command us to love one another as he has loved us? The only way he could command us to love is that in that way, just like he loves us, is that he has given us or imparted to us the love of God. Because without the love of God imparted to us through the new birth, it would be impossible for us to love like God loves. But he's put that love on the inside of us. He commanded us to do it because he's given us the ability to do it. Now that's good news, isn't it? That God has put his love on the inside of you and now he gives us a command to love one another even as he loves us. 
And in verse 17 of John 15, he says, These things I command you, that you love one another. You see, Jesus again and again gives this command to love one another. Now, we, it brings us now to John chapter 13. And in John chapter 13, we're going to look at verse 34. And Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So again, he emphasizes that we are to love one another, but he said we are to love one another as he loves us. Then he says, by this will, will all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another or for one another. The way that the world is going to know about Jesus is that they're going to see that love in us. Now, love is not just in word because 1 John says, don't love in word only, but in deed and in truth. Love is to be spoken, and that's a major emphasis in the word of God that we are to speak the truth in love. We are to speak to one another in love. We are to communicate love by our words, but we're also to communicate love by our action. Love is more than just a feeling. Love is more than just an emotion, although it affects our feelings. It affects our emotions. But you don't always feel like loving. You don't always have the emotion running high in the love department. Can anybody identify? Well, God didn't command us to love when we feel like it. He didn't command us to love when your emotions are running high in love or affection for a person. But thank God he commanded us to love. So love must be more than a feeling. And love must be f more uh, than just an emotion. Love is something that is shed abroad in our hearts. According to uh, Romans 5 and 5, it says, And hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is helping us to love. He pours forth the love of God in our heart. The Holy Spirit helps us to be able to love when we don't feel like loving. When someone maybe ha has done something to offend you or some, something that hurts you and something that uh, didn't make your feelings want to respond in love. Or your emotions want to respond in love, but yet there's love on the inside. And hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you have hope that if you will love, that it will work. Because the scripture says love never fails. Love never fails. It never becomes obsolete. It never comes to an end. This is a mainstay in the kingdom of God. Love of God is shed abroad in your heart. Love is referred to in Galatians chapter 5 as a fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus said, I am the vine and you're the branches. And he that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing, but we're not without him. How many are glad you're not without Jesus? Without Jesus, you could do nothing. You could not produce the fruit. But there are nine fruit of the Spirit listed there in Galatians chapter 5. It says that uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and meekness and faithfulness. God's fruit of the Spirit. And how does it produce in our life? The love of God is within us. The life of God is in us. The, the life that comes from Jesus. We're abiding in the vine. We're living in the vine. We're connected to Jesus. And if you're connected to Jesus, you're connected to life. And if you're connected to life, then you're connected to love. And if you're connected to love, then you have the ability to love. And you can love when you don't feel like it. You can love when you've been offended. You can forgive and you can let go of the past. And you can let go of the hurt. And you can let go of the pain. And you can let the love of God overmaster you. 
instead of going down in your emotions and sinking down into your emotions and sinking down into the flesh and sinking down in, into your hurt feelings, thank God you can rise up on the inside because greater is he that's on the inside of you than he that is in this world. So the love of God is greater than hate and love is greater and it enables you to forgive and to let go of your pain. Amen. Amen. So Jesus said, this is what I'm commanding you. It's a new commandment. In verse 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all know that you're my disciples. If you have love one to another. So we have the love of God for us. He's proven it to us. Now he's put it in us, and now it can flow through us. Somebody say, God is good. good. Now God has put that love on the inside of us, enabling us to love so that all will know. Now if you can't get people in the church walking in love, then this world is a pretty hopeless place. But the church loving each other, We loving each other, walking in love is proof to the world that Jesus is real. Years ago, the Holy Spirit spoke a phrase to me. He said, love is a pulling power that pulls people out of darkness into light. Love is a pulling power that pulls people out of darkness into light. So when we're walking in love and they see that we're loving each other, Doesn't matter what color, doesn't matter what culture, doesn't matter our differences in the natural. When we walk in love and we love each other, God shows himself strong through us. And we are like a light in the world holding forth the word of life. We're like a light in this world and people see Jesus in us. The Apostle Paul said, it's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live in this flesh or in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we live by faith in Jesus. Jesus can help you to love when you don't feel like responding in love. When you feel like acting or reacting in anger, But the love of God is on the inside. And you can choose to love. Everybody say, love is a choice. Love is is not just a feeling. Love is not just an emotion. Love is a choice. Because that love is on the inside. You can choose to dip dip into the love of God. And you can choose to share it with others. You can draw on that love that's on the inside and you can choose to bear the love fruit that God has designed you to bear and you're designed to love. You're created to love. Your brain was wired for love. You're made to love, created to love. God created you in Christ Jesus and he created you to love people. Amen. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew Chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, we're going to go to verse uh, 35. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, testing Jesus, saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? What is the great commandment in the law? Jesus responded and said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. So Jesus said the great commandment is, the first and great commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I love it when young people like Nia are showing their love for Jesus. Like ministers showing his love for Jesus, giving their life for Jesus. 
As a teenager, the Holy Spirit, one of the things that the Holy Spirit uh, showed me and, and revealed to me was the love of God. It was an amazing change and transformation in my life as a teenager when I saw the love of God. And I came to realize how much God loved me. I was raised in church. I was around church. But church, just being there doesn't change your life. Receiving what's there is what changes your life. When you receive what the Holy Spirit is doing, when you receive the Word of God, it changes your life. And so Holy Spirit opened up my heart, and I opened my heart to God, and it was just an amazing transformation because I began to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and it changed me forever. What God can do in your heart when you yield to Him. Loving God. Well, what happened was that I saw his love for me. And when I saw how much he loved me, then it made me want to love him back. In other words, there is a law of return. There is a reciprocal effect. When you see how much God loves you and how much he cares for you and how much he's done for you in sending his son Jesus to give you life, and he said with him he freely gives you all things to enjoy. In other words, there's no holding back from God. God gives you everything with Jesus. He gave you the greatest gift when he gave you Jesus, but he freely gives you all things with him. In other words, everything is included in the redemptive work of Jesus. And so God's goodness is expressed in his son. And when I saw how much Jesus loved me, how much God loved me, I began to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and it changed me forever. Life became different. I wasn't just at church. I became the church or part of the church and what God was doing in the walls, inside the walls. You understand? Holy Spirit wants to work in our hearts. He wants to work in our lives, and he changes us on the inside. And when he changes us on the inside, it changes us on the outside. Can somebody say, God is good? So his first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then what does he say? And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You should love your neighbor as yourself. So how can you love someone else if you don't love yourself? But seeing that God loved you and he proved that love to you and he gave his son for you and realizing and recognizing the love that God has for you causes you to value yourself. When you see how much God placed value on your life, how much he cared for you, how much he was willing to give for you, what does it do on the inside? It causes you to see that you're you're valuable. You're valuable to him. He loves you. So he's placed an amazing value upon your life. He loved you, as we said earlier from Scripture in John 17. He loves you like he loved Jesus. And he put that kind of love on the inside of you. So you're valuable. You're precious. You're important. You need to respect and honor yourself. Because if you love yourself in the right way, the way God loves you, then you're able to love others. If you have self-respect, then you're able to respect others. If you honor yourself in the proper way. So I don't believe loving yourself in this sense is selfish. Because loving yourself the way God loves you causes you to love others. It causes you to be able to love others. People that don't have self-respect don't respect others. People that don't have self-value don't value others. They abuse themselves, so therefore they abuse others. They hurt themselves, so therefore they hurt others. They speak evil to themselves, so they speak evil to others. They downgrade themselves, so they downgrade others. Why? Because they don't have that self-worth and value. They don't realize and recognize how much God loves them. And if they don't recognize how God loves them, that they don't value themselves. And when you don't value yourself, it's difficult for you to value others. So he says that we are to love others 
as we love ourselves. So you've got to choose to love yourself. That is a work in progress, isn't it? To value yourself, to honor yourself, have self-worth. God created you in Christ. You're his workmanship. You're his handiwork. God created you in his own image and after his likeness, so you must be valuable to God. As far as God is concerned, he sees you looking like him. He sees you look like him. He created you in his image and after his likeness. Thank you, Jesus. So he said, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. What a word. On loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Let's go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Verse 42, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe men and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. You tithe men and rue and herbs and you do the right thing in that area, but you pass over justice and the love of God. Well, we don't want to just do some good things and not let it be motivated by the love of God. We want to read our Bibles. We want to go to church. We want to pray. We want to do the good things. We want to tithe. We want to give. But we don't want to pass justice and the love of God. Love is at the center. It's at the core of Christianity. We don't want to just go through the religious motions, and we don't want to just do things because it just is the right thing to do only. We want it to be motivated by the love of God. So when we go to church, we go to church because we love God. When we read our Bibles, we don't just read it out of a religious duty. We read it because we love God and we want to know him. We want to fellowship with him. We want to have time in his presence. So we pray because we love him. So our relationship with God is a love relationship. He loves us. We love him. And the deeper that relationship and that fellowship goes, the easier it becomes to not just go uh, to church and not just just read your Bible and not just uh, act Nice to people, but do it motivated by the love of God, letting the love of God flow out of us. Praise God. And it's not manipulative. It's not for self-advantage. It's not uh, to just get your way or to get ahead. You don't love people to just see what you can get out of them. No, you love them, but there's always a return. I said there's always a return. When you love and you give, there's always a return. God will make sure they or someone will love you in return. There's always a reciprocal effect. There's always a coming back to you. The love of God is coming to you, and God is loving you and showing his love and revealing his love. Why? Because he sees you acting in love. And the more you give, the more you receive. So if you'll sow, you shall reap. And we don't just do it out of religious duty. We do it out of love for God. Loving one another is Jesus' command. Let's go to Romans chapter 13, please. Romans chapter 13. Beginning with verse 7, it says, Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, 
It's coming up. <laughs> Pay your taxes. He says, taxes to whom taxes are due. Custom to whom custom. You may have a different custom from someone else, but that doesn't mean you can't be together and can't love each other. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Reverence to whom reverence or honor to whom honor. There's something about honor that attracts. In other words, if you honor someone, they're attracted to you. If you respect someone, they're attracted to you. When you give out in love, people want to respond to you. You say everybody doesn't. We understand because some people don't know how to receive it. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't give it. And sometimes after a season of loving people, even if they don't receive it seemingly, their heart opens up because they see it as genuine. So many people have been hurt in life, and because of their past hurts, it's hard for them to receive love. It's hard for them to hear words of love. It's difficult for them to open up to people because they've been hurt in the past, and it closes them off. But let me urge you and encourage you. Walk in love and forgive even as God has forgiven you. If God has forgiven you, then you can forgive others and release people. Don't let the hurt of the past hinder you from your relationships in the future. Don't let the devil stop you from being effective in relationships. If you're going to have an effective marriage, love has to be at the center. If you're going to have an effective friendship, love has to be in the center. If you're going to have a, an effective relationship with people, it's important to have love at the center. And that's the reason you have a relationship. You're, at, you're in love with people. You love people. You care about people. You honor people. You respect people. You're giving. It's not just a taking. But you give and you shall what? Receive. So he says, honor to whom honor. Oh, no one, anything except to love one another. So we have a debt to love, don't we? Oh, no one, anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Remember, Jesus said, on these two commandments, hang the whole law and the prophets. Weymouth's translation for Matthew chapter 22, it says the whole law and the prophets is summed up in these two commandments. The whole law and prophets is summed up in these two commandments, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. Here he says, when we love one another, we fulfill the law for the commandments... You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. These are part of the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments. He said, you shall not commit adultery. If you love someone, you're not, commit, you're not going to commit adultery because you see the effect. You can see beyond the pleasure of a moment. You can see the effect that it could have on that other husband or wife. You can see the effect that it could have on your husband or wife, depending. You can see the effect that it could have on their children. You can see the effect that it's going to have on your children. You can see the effect it's going to have on their children. You see how the enemy blinds people, and they think it's the pleasure of the moment. And the scripture says there's pleasure in sin for a season, but there's a, there's a quick end to that season. But if you love someone, you're not going to commit adultery. If you love someone, if you love people, then you're not going to uh, steal from them, or you're not obviously going to murder someone. If you care about them, you love them, you respect them, you honor them. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to bear false witness or tell a lie on them. Now, how many times 
Have people's relationships been broken because someone spoke a falsehood? Supposedly a friend. Supposedly somebody that cared for you and you cared for them. And they spoke a lie. And it brought a breach between the two of you. He said, don't bear false witness. Don't covet your neighbor's wife or their goods or anything that belongs to them. You don't need to covet someone else's stuff. If you love them, you want them to have what they have. You're happy that they are blessed. You're happy for them to enjoy God's best. Right? You don't have to covet other people's stuff. You can get your own. You can work hard. You can give your mind to something. You can, you can develop your dream. You can do something that, that causes you to excel, and you can have things that God has promised you. But he says if you love people, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to uh, covet their stuff. No. Love is the fulfilling of the law. If there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, you're going to treat them the way you'd want to be treated. You're going to love them the way you'd like to be loved. You're going to uh, honor them the way you'd like to be honored. You, you're going to respect them the way uh, you'd like to be respected. You love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So we're not just under the law to keep all of the commands. We are to walk in the love of God, which causes us to fulfill the commands. In other words, in the Old Testament, if you didn't keep the law, you die. How many glad you're living under grace? We would have uh, more frequent funerals. But the grace of God in the New Testament is that God has put his love on the inside of us. God has given us the ability to fulfill the commandments. Don't kill, don't murder, don't steal, or don't covet. God has put the ability to do that on the inside of us, and we can fulfill the law by walking in love and choosing to love. And remember, love is a choice. You don't just love when you feel like it. You love because it's a command. You don't just love when your emotions are running high in the love department seemingly. You do it because it's a command. And Jesus has commanded you to love. And he didn't just say love based on your terms. He said love even as I have loved you. Love even as the Father has loved me. That same kind of love is on the inside of you, which enables you to do what I've commanded you to do, and that is to love one another as you love yourself. If you love God first and you commit your heart and your soul, your mind to him and love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then it enables you to love yourself and value yourself and it enables you to love others and value them. The love of God is a key ingredient for your life and the success of your life and the success of your friendships, relationships, marriages, families, churches. It is a key ingredient for everything you do in your life. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you today for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he's our teacher, and we believe that he's working in us to will and to do of your own good pleasure. And so, Holy Spirit, we acknowledge you working in us. And we believe, Holy Spirit, that you're working in each of our hearts today, causing us to be able to love and to forgive and to let go of the past and to live again. Holy Spirit, stir up our spirit. Stir up our hearts and stir up our pure minds by way of remembrance. Today, in the name of Jesus. We speak your grace over your people. We speak your grace over their hearts, their minds, their lives, their families. In Jesus' name, 